Yeah, um, let's go. Shall we start with the Nobel Prize? What do you think? Please, yeah. And you told me that you uh, had lunch with Carrie on, on Friday. And uh, she probably didn't uh, or wasn't sure yet if she'll win the Nobel Prize. Or no, not. no, no, no. There was no... We, we we had a lovely lunch together at Cold Spring Harbor at a, mm -hmm. a store, a meeting about history of molecular mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. and it was to celebrate 50 years of recombinant DNA, which, of course, is a technology that kind of mm -hmm. essentially impacts all of us, you mm -hmm. know, and all of our work. And... Um, um, and then, uh, you know, Kati and I and others were there kind of to give um, perspectives on um, kind of, you know, follow on work, uh, biotechnological applications, you know, um, genomics in my case and so on. And um, we had a lovely lunch in Cold Spring Harbor together on Friday, kind of, um, you know, catching up and reminiscing. And, and Kati shared her story with us about, you know, her journey through um you know the 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 basic science discovery of how the immune system responds to rna in unmodified form but not in the modified form which is you know crucial for the vaccine design and then how how she did her you know her basic research in in um in philadelphia and then of course switch to industry basically realizing that the application you know of this basic science finding about the immune system could be applied to vaccines. And of course, then she joined BioNTech and the rest is history. Um, and, you know, she also told us about her, um, you know, the, the challenges that she faced in her research career, because she didn't have a beautiful sort of streamlined, easy pathway, you know, but instead she, she had a lot of struggles uh, you know, immigrating to the U.S., um, you know, ha being accepted kind of in the the traditional uh, academic kind of, um, you know, professorial track and so on and so forth, um, you know, and, and so it's she's an incredibly inspiring person. It's an incredibly inspiring story. And of course, it saved, you know, many, many millions of lives. And, um, you know, it's just so wonderful. Uh, that that the achievement's been recognized uh, with a Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine yesterday, and you know just just uh, very very richly deserved, um, and an amazing story of how you know fundamental basic science, uh, you know an advance really that's curiosity driven, can then you know be applied to to save the world kind of, and and it sort of shows I think also the value of investment in those very fundamental discoveries, well, discoveries. You know, I'm an entrepreneur now, you know, I built foreign yeah. companies in Japan and we do a lot in the pharma and medical device uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And one thing uh, you said, you know, what we can learn from her and from the, from the vaccine development, I, what I feel is also there's a change in how society sees the pharmaceutical industry because of the, uh, development of the very rapid development of the vaccine because mm -hmm. uh, before this uh, there was in the society in America and Europe and also in Japan there was this attitude that oh uh, uh, the pharma industry is earning too much money and making too much profit you know and whereas uh, today people understand how the uh, pharma industry has contributed to solving this enormous problem of the virus so I think her mm -hmm. Her discovery contributes also to uh, wider facts. As, of course, the but science. To understanding, facts. yeah, how the different kinds of science sort of work together to get sort of things to 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 a state where they can be applied in society. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, what the benefits, direct benefits for society are of science. No? You can directly see the benefits. You know, That's unless you very, have very, vaccine, very unless clearly. You're... <laughs> Unless you are against vaccines, you know, <laughs> but everybody who uh, sees, you know, how the the vaccines have worked, you know. Okay. That's right. Yeah, because it really applies to the whole of society, whereas for, for most diseases, it will only be a tiny, you know, will only be a certain patient cohort that will benefit from the medicine, whereas yeah, for the, yeah. the COVID vaccine, it was the whole of society. And those very the principle, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it has changed kind of the attitude of society to the pharma industry 
overall I, I guess what no, it's great I mean that people understand you know how we all fit together and how we all need to work together to mm -hmm. to translate scientific discoveries you know and, and and also biotech you know BioNTech was a biotech and Pfizer is the pharma and then of course you know we had uh, AstraZeneca with the adenoviral vaccine with Oxford University so that was like a very direct academic pharma collaboration um you know, the BioNTech Pfizer was the, you know, original RNA research in academia, but then, you know, the biotech company really pushed forward the translation and then worked with the big pharma Pfizer. So all the different components, you know, kind of interact with each other to make the, the to, for the journey from basic science to kind of the application in society so yeah i know it's been interesting the pandemic has certainly been very instructive and very interesting in that sense another factor which i find interesting it's a bit away from the topic of our discussion but it maybe it's part of your mottos i've seen in your philosophies in your research life is that almost all the key people in this uh, vaccine development are immigrant immigrants uh, you look if you look at the top people at uh, uh, BioNTech and Kati and the chief of the chief of um, uh, uh, Pfizer and the chief of AstraZeneca and the people Moderna people they're all immigrants all immigrants all of them and that's also quite interesting I think well and and so am I and and so are you right I guess. Uh... That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. shall we start? Uh, maybe you can start. I've seen on your first slide already your introduction. And uh... okay, let's see if this works again. Can you see this? Yes, fantastic. Very good. Wonderful. Yeah, so just to say thank you so much, um, Gerhard, for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you for, for everybody from the uh, Trinity family and also. Uh, our friends here in Japan for for being here and uh, for hosting me. It's a it's a lot of fun and a really wonderful opportunity. So so um, I joined the college in 1993 as an undergraduate. So that's basically almost exactly 30 years ago today. So beginning of October is always the beginning of term, uh, as you'll know. And um, yeah, so so as Gerhard said, you know, as an immigrant, <laughs> so to speak, um, my mother's American, my father's German, and I grew up mostly in Germany, a little bit in the US, and um, matriculated in 1993 as an undergraduate in, in, in Trinity in Cambridge University for natural sciences, and, and landing in Great Court was like landing on a different planet. Um, you know, the 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 porters wear bowler hats and, and suits and so on. So it was a really uh, like a different universe to me, um, a universe that I really grew to appreciate and, and love. And of course, then you know, I was a, a scholar living and, and lived in college for the three years and, uh, you know, made wonderful friendships in those early years, including meeting my husband, who's 30 years later, kind of still together, a research scholar. Um, then uh, during the PhD years, um, and then as a JRF, as as Gerhard said, um, and, uh, and and so I lived in college during all of that time, um, and uh, and only moved out when I when I got married and um, uh, moved to Mill Road, which is kind of in the in the in the the, the town part of of Cambridge. Um, when I when I started my my um, independent research group, well, I was actually already working at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology as a program leader. So that's the kind of iconic institute um, where the the double helix was discovered, and uh, many of my Trinity colleagues also worked there. Um, I I should say that at this point, so speaking uh, to you today, I'm sort of south of Cambridge on what's called the Genome Campus where there are two institutes, the European Bioinformatics Institute and the Wellcome Sanger Institute. And I'm head of one of the departments at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. And the department is called Cellular Genetics. And so, and I'm also a member of the physics department, actually, like Gerhard. So we share not only the college, but also the university department. I've seen what, what are you doing at the Cavendish. I've seen there's a new Cavendish uh, 
uh, director now. Uh, uh, I want yeah, to Mette Apertura, yeah, has just taken over from Andy Parker. So I'm in theory of condensed matter in the oh, okay. theory. TCM. And the reason for that is that a lot of the methods, the statistical and computational <laughs> and modeling methods that we use for biological data sets are shared by the theorists in, in TCM mm -hmm. theory. So that's where I sit one day a week. So the story that I'll tell you today is a combination of that, requires a combination of that theoretical and computational work, as well as genomics and, 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 and biology. And it really begins with the resolution revolution in genomics. And uh, uh, so I'll start off telling you about this technology revolution that's really, you know, been an incredibly exciting change in, in, in biology and biomedicine. And then a project called the Human Cell Atlas, which uses those technologies to map all the cells in the human body and understand them in, in, in molecular detail at high resolution. And then talking about how that map of the human body, the, the, the map of our cells can be applied. And um, so I'll start off with a, with a bit of background just so that we're on the same page. Um, uh, of course, to, to say that the central dogma in biology is that the DNA that's identical in every single cell in our body encodes the genetic information. It's sort of the book of life, if you like. And um, DNA is then transcribed into the messenger molecule, which is RNA. And of course, the Nobel Prize that we discussed earlier is, um, you know, it re revolves around the use of this molecule, this intermediate messenger, which then uh, codes for proteins, which are sort of the, um, the, the active factories of the cell. So the DNA and the RNA, the information carriers, and the proteins are, are sort of the active um, business molecules, if you like. Now, the, the human body uh, consists of, of trillions of cells and is, is organized into, into organs, as you can see, and each organ has tissues which are made up of combinations of cells. And so, um, you know, showing the 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 um, the, the nasal uh, the the lining of the nose has combinations of, of cell types that make the nasal epithelium. The 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 alveoli in the lung, deep down in the lung, has a certain tissue composition. Um, the heart, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And each one has a plethora of different cells that need to work together to carry out the function. But every single cell. Um, has pretty much exactly the same genome, um, which is which is is the DNA uh, that consists of twenty three pairs of molecules and our chromosomes. And so, how are the different cells? Uh, how do the different cells come about if we have the same information within each cell? Well, it's that uh, a, a neuron versus a muscle cell. Um, versus a, a, a blood vessel cell will have different active genes um, that are switched on inside it. So the DNA carries the information, but then the way that information is interpreted uh, is different in each cell and results in a different complement of genes being active in the different cells. And that's what's shown on this slide. So in a way you can think of the DNA as kind of being the piano and the keys of the piano but the music that's played on that piano is basically a different tune in each cell. And one tune will make myocytes, the muscle cells, another tune will make neurons, the neuronal cells, and so on. So it's interpreted in different ways in different cells. And of course, the, the being able to actually sequence the order of bases, the order of letters in our chromosomes, in our DNA, was absolutely transformative technology. And... Um, and 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 it and it and it allowed the community to work together to to uh, sequence the book of life and the human human complete the human genome sequence and and the the institute where I am now, which is named after Fred Sanger, the Welcome Sanger Institute, was a major contributor to the reading of that book of life. Now today, kind of twenty years later, a new resolution is underway, a new technology revolution. That's what I'll come on to now. And that that has allowed us to do something to do to, to to venture on a different journey, which is mapping the cells in our body. 
Now, the idea that we need to understand our cells at molecular resolution actually goes back a long way. And in uh, Sidney Brenner's Nobel lecture 20 years ago, you know, he's, he's um, uh, also has a, a sort of career history in Cambridge in, in that institute uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, um, where he worked on cellular mech and cellular mechanism called apoptosis and studied the, the earthworm. Uh, in his Nobel lecture, he said, we need a program of making maps of cells and maps of how cells talk to each other. And he called this project the cell map project. And he said, we don't need a model organism. And what he meant by that is we can just study ourselves, the human body, because we need to understand the cells in the in human tissues. And that will be one of the things to occupy us for the next few decades. Now, now at that time, you know, over 20 years ago, there wasn't really availability of technology that would allow us to do this in a comprehensive, systematic, scalable way. But it's really the the, the technology that I'll come on to that's um, been transformative. And this suite of technologies that I'm going to call cell atlasing technologies allow us to um, to to basically get together in a project called the Human Cell Atlas Consortium, the Human Cell Atlas Project. And again, um, the institute where I'm sitting today, the Sanger is a major contributor. And this is this is a book of tissues, if you like, and it's a book of cells in our tissues. And so that technology that's really buoyed that endeavor is uh, single cell genomics. And, and what do I mean by single cell genomics? It's, it's essentially a, a suite of approaches that allow us to do that, that sequencing of nucleic acids. But instead of taking a chunk of tissue and mushing it up and looking at the whole sample as an ensemble, what it allows us to do is to have such a sensitivity that we can study individual cells or nuclei and um, essentially resolve tiny, tiny amounts of nucleic acid so that we can distinguish the RNA content in individual cells and then using computational methods, so these data science modeling and so on, you know, that Gerhard and I talked about, um, we can then um, distinguish from the data itself, from this sequencing data that's profiling the molecular content of the cell, the difference between the individual cellular components of a heterogeneous tissue sample. And that's really, you know, been transformative. It's it's the, the sequencing technology. It's of course been buoyed by the deep learning and generative AI resolution in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, um uh, you know, that 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 that's that's been an incredible journey. Now that that those those technologies that are looking at suspension cells or the nucleus, which is the kind of um uh, information center of the cell is are complemented by uh, other high resolution technologies that have developed a pace in parallel over the past 15 years or so, which is the um, the spatial genomics technologies. And the the the, the uh, special thing about these technologies is that you can take a solid tissue sections or salami slice a tissue very, very finely into say a 10 micron or so uh, fine section and then sequence the nucleic acid content of that tissue in, in an XY, essentially what's a sort of XY coordinate system. And that allows you to then, of course, computationally piece together, you know, using this data, plus those, those uh, suspensions, individual cell data points that I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, 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 the tissues in, um, in, 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 in the organs and understanding the individual cells and their molecular content. Now I've mentioned the importance of uh, the computational data science AML methods and um, just examples of some of these uh, uh, from our group and collaborators are just shown here to give you a flavor of the tasks that are important. So of course, you know, we need to predict the cell types. We need to predict the cell-cell interactions. We need to, analyze this very high dimensional data, which consists of 25 to 30,000 genes, you know, across um, hundreds of thousands of cells into a lower dimensional space. We need to, we also need to understand how the cells develop and how they align um, in their 
you know, uh, developing from a stem cell to a specialized cell state, from a, a, a resting cell to an activated immune cell state. We need to understand um, also where cells are mapping kind of at single cell resolution. That's this drug to cell. And I'll, I might come back to that later. So to give you a kind of um, history of technological innovation in this area and, and um, just at, at a high level, we really need to go back to 2009 to understand the, the origins of this revolution, resolution revolution in genomics, where in fact, um, a lab in Cambridge and the Garden Institute, Azim Sarani, was studying primordial or, or early developmental um, cell states in the mouse embryo. And because they only had tiny, tiny numbers of cells in the, in, to start with, they wanted to sequence each individual cell. And so picked the cells by hand and then um, uh, did this nucleic acid sequence amplification in a, in a sort of very manual way. And, um, and, and then really the technology developments have included well plates, 96 well plates, three of four well plates and robotic handling, integrated fluid, microfluidics chips, um, you know, further uh, scaling uh, with, with liquid handling robots, microfluidic droplets, and then um, technologies that, that, that are in, in uh, Pico well plates and miniature, and it's the miniaturization and the, the, the scaling really that's allowed these technologies to get up to a level where we're studying millions of cells and um, um, and and can actually you know realistically think about mapping the entire human body in in its in its in a comprehensive way. Um, so it's this combination of technologies: the single cell genomics, the spatial genomics, the data science methods, the AI ML methods that have really um, um, uh, it, you know allowed us to en embark on this exciting journey through the cells of our body and to ask what determines cell identity, how do our cells assemble in tissues, and, and what's the cellular basis of, of our physiology. So that's really um, a sort of introduction into the, the framework that's that that or the, the the sort of era of technology and data science that we live in. And um, the 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 you know, having being part of this uh, resolution revolution, and moving to the Sanger Institute, where I, where I took on this department in in late 2015, early 2016, I realized that we could work together globally to tackle this this very ambitious goal that sort of goes beyond, um, you know, the capability of a traditional academic lab or even a even a single research institute or even a single country. And um, I reached out to my colleague, Aviv Regev, who was in Boston at the time uh, at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. And she had basically advocated for something called the human, which she had dubbed the human cells. At that time, of course, we, you know, there, there, there was no consortium. And, and she, we, she was immediately on the same page to work together towards this, this um, uh, vision of an international community of scientists who, who basically get together in a grassroots way um, towards making the comprehensive reference map of our cells. And, and we called this international um, project, the Human Cell Atlas, developed the logo, the website, the uh, organized a meeting, rallied the community. And basically that, that kickoff meeting was in October, 2016. So um, uh, in, in, in London, we, we had some, some funding from the Wellcome Trust. There were about 100 people. And um, we then basically uh, you know, were fortunate to get support of not only our scientific academic colleagues in the community um, across computational methods, uh, genomics colleagues, biomedical uh, scientists, clinicians, and so on, but also the funders. And this allowed us to really grow a community that now has over 3,000 members. Um, you know, together we've mapped over, over 100 million cells from dozens of tissues in the body. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been an incredible journey. And we're, we, are, we are coming to the end of the first phase of this project. You know, there's still, the, the journey isn't finished. We still have 
you know, a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, but the the, uh, the the project is well and truly launched now and making a lot of progress. Um, so you can see here that, you know, we've got members in, in um, over over 80 countries in the world. I mentioned over almost 3000 members. And of course, we have, um, you know, key members in, in Japan. And in fact, one of our founding members, uh, Pierre Carninci, was in, in Rick and Yokohama at the time. And um, and and so and there is a um, you know a, an important community that contributes in Japan, and I'd be delighted if more members joined and if we could strengthen those ties um, uh, with 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 Japan. There's also I, I should Pierre, say he just moved to, uh, back to Italy, I think. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he's he still goes back and forth between Italy and and Japan. Um, and and he's kind of a wonderful link across continents, actually. Um, and he was instrumental, you know, in the in the Asian uh, and also establishing uh, a regional network in Asia. Um, we have we have a meeting, and and we've had you know a human cells general meeting in Japan, and we've got a, a human cells Asia meeting coming up in November in Kolkata and in India. Um, uh, we we also have regional networks in Latin America and Africa now, which is you know uh, wonderful because the Human Cell Atlas is a Human Cell Atlas for everybody across the world. It's a Human Cell Atlas of of um, the the citizens of the of the entire world, and that principle was really embedded in our philosophy from the very beginning. Is that we want to have an equitable Human Cell Atlas, both in terms of the, the, the scientists who are participating, also in terms of the, the samples that we're studying so that the, 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 the cell atlas and the tissues are representative of the entire world. And, um, you know, we've had funding and support to have, um, as I mentioned, meetings across the world, but also training and workshops and participation across the world. So I mentioned that we have almost, uh, you know, uh, 120 million cells. This is, this is the precise number. And um, the way we've organized the community from a, um, a scientific interest point of view is not just in terms of the computational analysis. We have an analysis working group and the, the technologies. We also have a standards and technologies working group, but in terms of also by, by what we call biological networks, which represent the different um, uh, uh, medical and biological expertises. So liver, reproductive tissues, kidney, brain sort of central nervous system and so on and so forth and what this what we we feel this represents is really not just um you know the science itself but also a new way of doing science that's inclusive and supportive of of many research communities in an equitable way across the world that we develop new approaches for for data generation and data sharing and the pan in the pandemic you know we've discussed the pandemic and, and the importance of the pandemic for really how the scientific community works together across academia, biotech, pharma, you know, in a, in a very networked way. And the Human Cell Atlas Network was, was another one of those networks that kind of came together in a very inspiring way um, in that public health emergence that, that we all faced in early 2020. And we shared our data very openly to map the viral entry receptors in the body. Um, and and um, you know have, uh, may come talk more about that. What's also important to us is empowering the next generation of scientists and and a lot training, allowing young people to develop their their science, their leadership, their collaboration in this community. So, what I'll come on to now, kind of in the last section, is how we can use the Human Cell Atlas. And what's what's the point of having this map of the cells of our body? What's the application? And, and there are two analogies that I'm going to use here. One is that the human cell atlas is really a guidebook um, for where the our genes and, and proteins, the molecules are expressed in the body at cellular resolution and, and why that's so, so important and powerful to have that guidebook. And then also that it provides a blueprint or a sort of instruction manual for the cells in our body. And illustrating this guidebook principle that, you know, during the pandemic, it told us 
where the viral entry receptors are expressed in the eyes, in the nose, in the mouth, kind of, which became really important for transition, for, for, for transmission understanding, but also in the internal organs in the body um, and where, where in how the, the virus can actually travel and infect the inside, the tissues inside our body. Um, but but the other kind of uh, application of a molecular guidebook at high resolution um, that, that I'd like to use here is the heart. And of course, the human heart has, you know, billions of cells, about 30 different tissues. So it's a complex organ. Um, you know, it's a it's a single you think of it as a single sort of pump that delivers the oxygen oxygenated blood around our body. Um but that pumping action is actually only possible through the coordinated action of many different tissue components. And each of those tissue components, you can see the tissues marked here with these little pointers, consists of you know, a, a, up to 100 different fine-grained cell types, roughly. Um, and in what, what we've studied is, is uh, not all of the, the 30 tissues, but a starting point, about eight different tissues, which consists of the, the muscular walls of the four chambers, the two atria and the two ventricles, and then also components of the cardiac conduction system, which is the electrical conduction system that we have in our heart. And what this gives us is, is 12 coarse grain cell compartments that we can divide into 75 different very fine grain cell types. And this is where the human cell atlas is incredibly powerful, is in revealing the sort of different shades of cells um, that, that we thought of before, maybe from, from more traditional microscopy and so on technologies as being, um, uh, uh, you know, um, a cardiomyocyte, we, we, we can then reveal there are actually, tw you know, 12 different subtypes of, of um, cardiac muscle cells. And so the, um, the, the story that I'm going to tell you is about this structure that's lit up here schematically, which is the sinoatrial node, um, which con contains the pacemaker cells uh, um, that basically determine the pace at which our heart beats. So these are very um, crucial cells, if you like, because they are amongst the only spontaneously beating or spontaneously firing cells in our body. And they have this clock-like mechanism basically for continuously firing um, that, that develops during embryonic development, during pregnancy, and then of course continues uh, um, autonomously um, firing basically until uh, it stops at the end of life. And that, that, um, that clock-like firing uh, is only made faster or slower by input from the autonomic nervous system. So it's kind of the, the neurons that go from the central nervous system and innervate um, the, this structure that then tells us to, to run fast if we see a bear kind of thing in an unconscious way. And so understanding these cells is really crucial um, because they're, they're fundamental to our life. Um, and and uh, also, of course, if, if there's something wrong in terms of the, the rate of beating or the coordination of the sending of the electrical signals to the heart, then this, this causes a disease and pathology. And so we've used the, the single cell genomics technologies that I just showed, but also spatial transcriptomics technologies to map uh, this sinoatrial node, so the, the, the cardiac tissue that contains these pacemaker cells and this, these different um, fine-grained tissue microenvironments are shown with the spatial genomics on the right-hand side. So the, um, the cells kind of control our heart rate. They're these pacemaker cells. And the way we discovered them from just two deceased transplant donor hearts that we gathered during the pandemic where transplant you know, was very, was dialed down a lot in the UK as elsewhere, was that in, in just a tiny amount from just a tiny amount of tissue and two donors initially, we discovered this little population that you can see in green here, that has a molecular signature that, that has a characteristic channel um, that we'd known from previous work was um, marking these, these uh, pacemakers as a particular calcium channel. Um, and, and these cells, this tiny little 
you know, less than 50 cells that are represented here have a different profile from the, um, the, the, the cells that have a, a sodium channel expression that are working cardiomyocytes. And we're using the spatial data, we can then, using deconvolution of the individual voxels in this tissue section, we can then computationally place these cells in the center of the nodal region and also identify, so identify precisely where they're located in the heart and which other cells are co-located with them. And these are shown here, um, kind of using microscopy to validate that indeed the, the cells that we discovered are, are uh, present and are hugged, if you like, by glial cells, so a, which belong to a neural compartment. And then in the spatial data, we can see signatures of, of the innervating neurons kind of from the autonomic nervous system and, and particular characteristics of the extracellular matrix that create this microenvironment. So it's not just the cell itself that's important and its molecular profile, but also the neighboring cells and how they are, um, how the whole microenvironment works together to make the, the tissue function and the heart function. And so, so in that way, that sort of illustrates how we're going about making this map of our tissues. Now, what, what's, what's the utility? The utility, one of the, 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 the things that struck us that's immediately useful is that we can then predict exactly in which cell uh, a drug is acting in the body and also where there might be on-target side effects. And, and to this end, we developed a, a computational framework that we call drug to cell, where we take a drug bank, a database of drugs and their targets, um, and, and then map where those, where those drugs might be acting on specific cells in our tissues based on this molecular fingerprint. And an unexpected finding in those little pacemaker cells that I've, that I've described to you was that um, they actually have a receptor that's actually thought to be involved in regulation of metabolism in the endocrine system, GLP-1 receptor. And that receptor is the target of, of drugs that... Um, that, that, that are analogous to the GLP-1 um, protein that, and, and these drugs are of course um, the, the, the weak OV or azempic diabetes drugs that are also used for weight loss now. And, and so they're very widely prescribed, widely deployed and widely used. And so it's important to under, and, and, and there've been reports of a six beat per minute uh, change increase in heart rate. And so what, what our data suggests is that that could be ascribed to um, a direct effect of, of the drug acting on the pacemaker cells via this GLP-1 receptor that's in the cell surface, rather than a potential, you know, operating in some other way, for instance, by the autonomous autonomic nervous system. So, so basically, in that way, you see that in terms of understanding where drugs are acting, how they might be operating in, in, and have unintended consequences, also uh, repurposing drugs, having the human cell as, as a, a, a guidebook is very powerful. And of course, the same principle holds for viral entry receptors. We've talked about ACE2 and TUMPRS2 for SARS-CoV-2 or other, other viruses where the human cell as community has worked together to map you know, um, uh, uh, where, where a virus could be docking. The same principle is true for genetic variations. So either rare, rare genetic variations that cause syndromes or common complex uh, um, uh, diseases, for instance, can, can then be mapped. The, 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 the uh, effect of the genetic variants can be mapped at this very high resolution cellular level. So just the last example of an application of the human cell atlas um, is, is as a blueprint. So as a, as a guidebook. And the example that I'm going to use there is the thymus and how we can use the map of the thymus to engineer cells. So the thymus is an organ you may not have heard about. It was only discovered in the 1960s as an immunological organ. It's um, um, uh, the, the place where hematopoietic stem cells come in from the bone marrow. And then inside this organ, there's the development of T cells to make mature killer T cells, helper T cells, and so on that are uh, key components of our immune system and defend us against pathogens. T cells, you may have also heard, have therapeutic potential in terms of CAR T cells that are used as cancer drugs, cancer therapeutics. And so there, um, um, there's, there's a lot of interest in how to engineer 
these cells in the dish. And so having a very high resolution picture and understanding of how cells develop in vivo in the thymus um, is has a utility in terms of providing a blueprint for how to engineer them in the dish. And the, um, the system that we've been using is um, uh, an in vitro system, an artificial thymic organoid system, so-called, that, that has some features of the in vivo thymus where we can use um, induced pluripotent stem cells to then eff effectively um, mimic the, the thymus in the dish to some extent, at least, and engineer T cells. And, and, and the, the, um, the optimization or, or design, if you like, of this process um, is, is instructed by our, um, in, in, in the lab, is instructed by our knowledge of how T cells develop in vivo. So there's a kind of yin and yang, a back and forth, where we can learn about how to engineer cells in the dish from the in vivo cell atlas, but also the process of studying and perturbing cells in the dish basically um, informs us on also on the mechanisms that are likely happening in the body. So there's a kind of virtuous cycle, uh, a, a sort of back and forth where we can learn from the human body about uh, in vitro engineering and vice versa. And someday, um, you know, we may be able to make cells in a factory like way using synthetic uh, approaches entirely. So, so looking forward, um, the human cell atlas really, this, this project, this data, this knowledge and insight really has a huge uh, potential basically for improving our well-being. You know, we've talked about vaccines. Um, there are a lot of diseases and conditions where, where the community has used the human cell atlas as a reference and then developed disease cell atlases, if you like, um, you know, of not only the COVID response in, in the nasal tissue and as well as the blood, but also many other infections, um, um, diseases of many different systems of the body where tissue samples have been taken from biopsies, from resection material and so on to compare the cell atlas of the disease to the healthy reference cell atlas and then learn from the difference between the two about the disease mechanism and what, what happens during the disease. And, um, and so this has really already given huge insights into, um, uh, you know, potential for, for drug development. And, and then of course, in the, in the long, long term, there's also, as I mentioned, kind of this, uh, potentially a way of um, making entirely synthetic cells. If we were able to, you know, um, synthesize entire human chromosomes chemically and design them based on human cell atlas data to then program cells to have features that, that are that are useful for um, for treating diseases, for instance, or for learning about a particular mechanism or feature of the cells in our tissues. And in fact, there's another uh, member of, of the Trinity family, you know, who's been working in this area, Jason Chin, who you may have uh, have also had in this series. So overall, um, you know, the, the story that I've told you today is about the resolution revolution in genomics, the human cell atlas as a project that's driven by a global community of scientists to map the cells in our body, and the utility of that knowledge as a guidebook for drugs and as a blueprint for engineering cells. I'd like to acknowledge, um, uh, you know, a lot of incredible people whom I've had the privilege of, of training and of working with in my lab, the, the here two young um, people who've worked on the, the, the heart cell atlas that I told you about. Dr. Kazamasa Kanemaru is a clinician scientist who's a po postdoctoral fellow in my lab and who's from Japan. And he's worked in an incredible partnership with James Cranley, who's a cardiology uh, clinician scientist in, in finishing his PhD in the lab. Uh, many other lab members and collaborators in, in London, but also in uh, in Germany, the US, and, and, and elsewhere who've worked together to make this possible. And the, 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 the work on the, the, the thymus that I mentioned and the artificial thymic organoids has also been an incredible partnership with um, lab members from across the world. Chen Chu Suo, who's a pediatric immunologist, clinician scientist, 
who's just finished her PhD and is now a clinical lecturer. Dan, who's just uh, uh, completing her PhD in the lab, is British and Italian and is moving to the US to Stanford for postdoc. And Denithi Sumanawera, um, who is an incredible computer scientist, postdoctoral fellow in the group. And I will stop there, say thank you, and take any questions. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for this really, really passionate and fantastic talk. Um, I'm very interested in your Simon's work because since about three, four years ago, I'm working with a British regenerative medicine venture, which works with a, with the Sir Francis Crick Institute on on bringing uh, research results to uh, to the patient, and so we help them with the funding and also with uh, Japan business development. And at the same time, we also, at the moment, I'm in preparations with a, uh, a venture which is developing T-cell-based uh, therapies for cancer. So I'm, you know, I, uh, like you said, you know, I, until recent, uh, until like I started this three years ago, so I, I never heard about thymus before, but uh, now, <laughs> Uh, now I know a little bit. <laughs> it's um, an interesting little organ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and there are certainly um, a lot of applications. In, in, uh, as and a mentioned. lot of that is emerging because, as yeah. you said, you know, it's not uh, not uh, well understood yet. And uh, there's uh, what, uh, what, what, how, uh, you know, how your thymus, thymus work. How does that fit in with the medical aspects of the thymus? So, you know, illnesses, like there are babies born without thymus. It's, a, I think, the George yes, disease. Correct. The George syndrome. Wow. I'm uh, so impressed with you, Gerhard. <laughs> you're, 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 you're a real polymath. Um, well, I'm working with, right, I, so... I had many discussions with the US <laughs> company developing. Uh, actually, they had a drug approval now from for a uh, um, therapy for the Georgia disease babies. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. well, I'll be really curious to talk more. <laughs> yeah. we I, we can, uh, maybe we can, yeah, I, I've we can been working that for three years yeah. now in this field, so maybe we can do oh, wow, something yeah, yeah, yeah. there. Okay, maybe yeah, yeah, person. I would be delighted. Um, I mean, I should say that I, I also have a role in, um, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Foresight Labs, which is a, okay. a US-based accelerator, a, Mm -hmm. Couple to Foresight Capital, mm -hmm. and I'm also co-founder um, of uh, two uh, biotech companies, Transition Bio and EnsoCell. Oh, okay. um, and uh, uh, yeah, so EnsoCell is cell kind of targeting. Transition Bio is more molecular condensate drug development. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it's so the, the for the George syndrome. Yeah. I mean, you know, the therapy that sort of uh, therapy that that was developed at Duke was, was exactly basically that's the one. Yes. transplant from cardiac surgery, and basically then taking the discarded thymic material and and transplanting it into the baby's thigh, so into the leg, uh, for reconstitution of the T cells from uh, the 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 um, the infant's own bone marrow. And that procedure was then brought to the UK to Great Ormond Street uh, by, you know, um, sort of pioneering clinicians there. And um, we've actually been working with them to study the the the, the tissues and the biopsies pre-transplant, so the the actual huh. original thymus, and then the uh, the 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 implanted tissue sections. And and tracking then the reconstitution of the of the T cells and the the, the immune system after transplantation, and so that's um, you know really interesting kind of system and um, you know incredibly exciting. So we may have shared interests. I'm happy to discuss that more. Um, and it's sort of a um, you know one of the the rare cases, I guess. Transplantation of organs is the other, but transplantation of the thymus is really you know, there when you have a hybrid immune system where the bone marrow comes from the, the recipient and mm -hmm. the thymus comes from, from the donor, and then the immune system is reconstituted from the combination of the two, if you like. Um, and, and certainly, you know, understanding having the thymus cell atlas, you know, we'll, we are hoping will be very valuable in also making the thymic transplantation procedure more um, effective. Okay. 
in terms of understanding, you know, what are the cells that are needed and what are the cells that uh, are are um, better discarded, if you like, prior to transplantation. Um, how effective is the reconstitution? Also using the cell atlas of the reconstituting immune system to understand, you know, which parts are reconstituted correctly in the infant, which ones are missing and so on. And, and of course, I don't know if you know, but there's also like self, you know, some um, side effects uh, of, of where, where there is self-recognition. So in skin, oh, you've yes, got, yes, yes. you know, where there's a oh, uh, yeah. kind of graft versus host type of, you know, sometimes. So understanding that in detail is also, uh, we hope will be useful to make the whole procedure better in the long term for the patients. There's another Trinity alumnus who uh, has a thymus company and uh, uh, they just, uh, the other day, they got, I think, $35 million from DAPA, the health part of DAPA oh, for yeah, yeah. development. Yeah. And I forgot his name, but I invited him also to give a talk here. So. Oh. Okay, Just, you should tell me. Maybe I can come. I'll tell you. Maybe we can convince up. him. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. He, it, the company, I think, is called Thymune, I think. And I think it's Harvard. Okay. I forgot. One of the big US universities. And I don't know the details, but he's a Trinity. He hasn't been long. I think he was a Gates scholar. So he was only, I think, one year Trinity or so. So he may be, not feel so attached to Trinity. But he was a time and he's an alumni. Maybe we should give a chance to your collaborator, Hafumi Nishi, to uh, take part in the discussion. Hafumi Nishi sensei, uh, ask to, uh, okay. Okay, so, okay, so may, may I ask just some, maybe it's a little bit technical questions about your talk, but okay. So, well, about the uh, heart cell atlas part, so you mentioned that uh, there was a uh, like re really tiny fraction of the pacemaking cell, I guess, and like you identified it by uh, checking the uh, some just some genes expressions, I guess. So like I felt like I uh, I'm not sure uh, if the professor Kinoshita mentioned, but uh, I'm currently working on the single cell RNA seq data with uh, Kinoshita and some other people, and and the one like one kind of issue is like how to say identify the what characterize the small like, fraction of cells. Say like uh, thanks to the, the cell, human cell address, now we can. Kind of identify the the like typical cell populations with the reference, but now it's really like important to identify the subtypes of the cells or a like small fraction of the cells that are not categorized into the kind of typical cell types. So I'm really interested in the how you kind of identify that small fraction of the cell as a like p a pacemaker cells. Uh huh. So 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 you know if you're um kind of, if they've been identified before, let's say, you know, in, in the heart cell atlas or thymus cell atlas or whatever, then then it's kind of easier because there are ways of just using artificial intelligence, machine learning models of the data to then predict the cells in a new data set. So for instance, we have celltypist.org, which is the logistical regression models of the, um, the single cell data that you can then just apply. There's Azimuth, you know, is a is a, another framework um, from Rahul Satija or um, SC Arches kind of label transform models, uh, you know, from Molot Falahi, Fabian Tyson, so on, can then just be used to predict. So that's that that then you know can be used to predict known cell types where you have models that you train on existing data. If you are trying to discover them de novo, like ab initio, completely new, then then it's more challenging, and um, basically, you know, there there are kind of a combination of two different methods. I mean, one is just using statistical computational methods and clustering and subclustering mm -hmm. until you have you know the smallest kind of unit of statistically coherent data points. 
or the uh, and but but then of course you know what what we did in in this case was combine that with prior knowledge from the literature of particular markers from mouse studies and so on and that gave us confidence you know together that gave us confidence that these these were these cells and then subsequently we went in and did you know microscopy validation we also studied sort of developmental cell states in the dish in terms of their um, beating properties uh, in in vitro and so on. So does does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I guess the, uh, for that identification of the uh, pacemaker cell, you just used the, the expression data, I guess, right? Or did you also use the spatial trans transcriptomics data as well? Ah, okay. So so um, in that particular case, we started from. Uh, so the first data that we that came that we had was single nuclear RNA sequencing data for the cells, and then we we then mapped them into the fifty micron so fifty micron resolution, mm -hmm. uh, Visium uh, spatial yeah. transcriptomics. Mm -hmm. um, that that that's more than one cell, of course. So it was deconvolution mm -hmm. yeah. of the spatial transcriptomics from the single cell data. Mm -hmm. yes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because like I felt like. Just working on the single cell RNA seq data is really hard to kind of identify, really identify the characters of the cells because it's really hard to like, differentiate like new cell types from the just noise or like experimental errors. <laughs> you know? um, so we so the way we uh, the way we've done that in the past um, is that we use a um, um, like a cross a leave one out kind of cross validation approach. Um, so we have a single cell uh, sort of clustering uh, framework called S uh, SCAF, S C A F. Mm -hmm. We published this in Nature Methods a few years mm -hmm. ago to kind of um, make sure that your your subclusters aren't noise, but they're actually representing a, a statistically mm -hmm. coherent mm -hmm. signal you can model by log logistic regression. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I see. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, completely, maybe, maybe crazy question, but you know, some people need a pacemaker when they get old, and because the pacemaking, the natural pacemaking, doesn't work anymore. Now, can your work somehow uh, help to make pacemakers better or more efficient, or to help in the patients who have that <laughs> issue? You know, in in Stuttgart, for yeah. example, the. Um, I worked with my, 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 when I was Trinity Fellow, I worked with Manuel Cardona. And one day he came uh, with like, you know, lots of bruises in the face because he had fallen off the stairs. And uh, so it was found out that that, was, it, that happened because he needed a pacemaker and he didn't have one. So from that point, so he was given a pacemaker. Now, now York, can that contribute uh, somehow to? Uh, yeah, so we mapped. So I didn't talk about the whole work, but mm -hmm. uh, you know what? What we mapped was was the 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 conduction system. So not just the sinoatrial, the pacemakers and the sinoatrial node, but also the atrioventricular node, the Purkinje fibers and the Purkinje cells. Mm -hmm. um, so the <laughs> how the the system is kind of um, distributed basically across the the chambers. Um, and you know what would be amazing would be one day to be able to kind of modulate or or repair that system if it's defective without having to implant a mechanical device or to mm. buy a lot, to, to use you know a um a less invasive kind of approach mm -hmm. and um certainly sort of studying you know also the disease conditions and using that disease cell atlas to healthy cell atlas kind of distinction you know may guide us towards how to go about that that sort of mm -hmm. a repair mm -hmm. and regeneration that process sounds, sounds fantastic <laughs> uh uh professor kinoshita do you have uh, questions maybe yes uh yeah thank you very much for your very amazing uh talk so i'm really uh enjoying the talk so i'm wondering about the resolution of the cell and at the same time, I'm wondering the resolution of the human differences, or in other words, the individuality 
Yeah, this is the question because I'm now working with the large scale genome analysis in Tohoku University. Now we have the uh, genome cohort uh, with 150,000 volunteers. It's very similar designs of the UK Biobank. And we are doing the whole genome analysis with that sample. And we have already completed the uh, 70,000 uh, whole genome sequence and now analyzing it. And always we are uh, suffer, uh, wondering about the individuality. So individual difference result in the uh, different variety of the proteins and it result in the different set of the uh, cell state, I guess. So I want to understand the connection between the uh, diversity of the individuality and the diversity of the cells. How do you think about it? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the human cell atlas and human genetics kind of have a close interaction in the sense that, mm -hmm. as I mentioned kind of in the talk, you know, the uh, we can map human genetic variation into the human cell atlas and mm -hmm. then understand more about potentially how variants can actually affect cells and tissues because we, you know, understanding where they are, where the genes are expressed mm -hmm. and also how there are changes in expression levels. And so, so by using the human cell as, as that guidebook concept, we can then map human genetic variants in. At the same time, you know, the next phase of cell atlasing for the human population would mm -hmm. be to have, you know, large, many, 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 many human cell atlases. <laughs> so we can understand the changes in cells and tissues for different individuals. And in fact, for UK Biobank, we have started doing blood sample analysis for UK biobank donors for a few thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's with uh, Nicole Soranzo and Oliver Stegler, funded by CZI. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and of course, for blood, because blood is so easily accessible, there mm -hmm. are now also other <laughs> many other projects where there are thousands of samples. So, you know, with Pierre Carnincci, who we talked about earlier, we're also... Um, uh, and, and with others, you know, there's a, a, a diversity blood cell atlas sort of sample covering different people around the world. Um, so, so I think there are many ways in which we'll start to understand uh, genetics at the cellular and tissue level mm -hmm. um, by, by integrating data sets, but also by generating larger data sets of cell atlases. Yeah, in that case, how you think about the use of the iPS cells uh, derived from the blood sample? Yeah, in the uh, healthy brand here, blood sample is the only sample can be taken. So we have to use it to understand the individuality in the cell levels. But I am thinking that the uh, iPS uh, expression level of the genes in the iPS cells may be different from the original tissues a little bit. So the difference may be critical to understand the uh, nature of the cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why, you know, uh, this this concept of the human cell atlas as a blueprint ah, yeah, is so yeah. important because it allows you to benchmark and understand what's different in your IPS-derived system to your in vivo system. And you can then say, aha, uh -huh, this is the same, but oh no, this this cell is different. You see, uh -huh. this this molecular program is the same, but this one is different. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I see. Yeah. Okay. I think you, uh, Sarah. We I think you. Uh, we promised you to leave you for your next uh, duties or you for your next work. Uh, <laughs> thank you so very very much. It was fantastic and. Uh, I think there were some some ideas. I, I'm extremely interested in the thymus because I've been working on this now. So maybe who knows? Maybe we can do something there. Mm. Uh, that would be fantastic. The people I'm working with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to think a bit. <laughs>